Thank you for joining us. My and pleasure. Again, the other thing I would just mention, afterwards visit with Glenn, but also in our war and terror room upstairs, uh, we have Glenn's flight suit. Can we hold down the noise in the back, please? Thank you. Okay, Glenn, all yours. Okay. Good morning. Thanks for uh, giving part of your Saturday morning to come listen to this. I've put this together so that we can do questions and answers as we go through. Um, I've got about 10 slides, so I'm not going not gonna to show you too many, too many things, but we can talk about interesting parts as we come to it. Um, on the initial slide here, that's a guy who, uh, Navy lieutenant-ish type, back out of my service record, and the wings of gold above that, Naval Aviator wings. I have a picture of the Midway, which will figure prominently as we uh, talk today. And uh, this is the cleanest A6 I've ever seen. I've never flown one that was anywhere near that clean, but it's a nice picture. And you'll note this one has 500-pound uh, bombs on the wings, and we'll talk about some different things that the airplane can carry as we go through today. Oh, and I will point out, I did this back in, uh, or a, something like this back in 2013 when this was first getting started, before we videotaped them or anything. So I, I think it was about number five or so. So there have been a few in the meantime. Hopefully this one is, uh, is good. Um, this is slide doesn't have, this is the only slide without pictures. So I figured we'd get the minutia out of the way right up front. Uh, I was a Naval Academy class of 79, uh, graduated with a degree in systems engineering. Uh, we were, that was the last all-male class, so that's just a historical point. It's neither good nor bad. That's just that's the, my situation. I went to, from there to flight school in Pensacola, Florida. I flew the uh, T-34C, which is a, a turboprop, uh, low-wing airplane. Uh, stayed in Pensacola for jet training and flew the uh, T-2C and the TA-4. So the T-2 is the Buckeye straight-wing uh, twin-engine airplane. That's the first airplane you go to the carrier on. And then the A-4 is a two-seat version of a, a real Navy attack airplane. Um, also picked up a, a wife there. She's in the back, Joanne. <laughs> yeah. it, was a, it was a busy, busy time. <laughs> uh, from, there, uh, from there, I went to Oce NAS Oceana in Virginia Beach and learned to fly the uh, A6 at VA-42, which was the training group, replacement air group, is the RAG acronym, and then was subsequently assigned to VA-75. Uh, Joanne and I got married right about it as I finished the, the uh, VA-42 syllabus, and then we went on a cruise for our honeymoon. I went to the Indian Ocean, and she went to the Caribbean. <laughs> uh, that's true. <laughs> um, and then she went back to, she went, she went to the beach. She moved back to Pensacola until I got back. Uh, after, so did about three and a half years there. I uh, did one interesting deployment. Uh, if anybody's seen uh, the, the new Top Gun movie, that was, we actually did do, uh, you guys get ready in two weeks, we're sending it to, to the Mediterranean. Uh, we got there, we were all ready to uh, conquer the world and the, the CO on the ship, CO on the squadron there says, hey, we need you guys to fly the tankers. We don't have enough guys to fly tankers. Uh, it was a little bit of a letdown, but we did get to go to Athens, so it wasn't a bad deal all around. Uh, after uh, A6s in Oceana, I became a tactics instructor at the Naval Strike Warfare Center in Fallon. That's uh, where Top Gun and uh, Strike Warfare Center are now located. Great place to fly. It's not the end of the world, but you really can see it from there. It's out in the middle of the desert. Um, Joanne lived through that part. And then uh, as a payoff for that, I got assigned to VA-185 in uh, Japan on the USS Midway. We'll talk more about that in, in some detail. Following the tour in Japan, I became the placement officer for A6s and EA6s, which means in uh, per, the Bureau of Personnel, I own the jobs, other people own the people, and we put them together in combinations that <clears throat> hardly anybody liked. <laughs> they call them orders for a reason. Uh, after that, because I was in the Bureau of Personnel, I somehow got a job at RAND as a fellow for a year. Uh, wrote, co wrote a book on the Chinese Air Force, uh, did some work on uh, other interesting projects. And that was where I learned, I think, my most profound professional kind of thought 
I figured out I was a lot smarter around smart people. <laughs> because you know, if, you, if you run your mouth around smart people, they'll call you on what you say. You need to think about it. If you're around folks that accept everything, then you, your standards can be a bit lower. Um, and then after that, after a year there, uh, this is about where, eight, where uh, A6s went away. They were retired. <clears throat> and I got a job in Albuquerque as, with the best job title that I had, which is the Chief of High Explosive Testing. That's a great job title. <laughs> so we, went, we mostly built things out of white sands and blew them up and, and played golf. <laughs> Uh, I retired out of that job in May of 99. That was 20 years in the Navy. I uh, became moved to Boulder to be a program manager out at IBM. Did that for five years and then uh, got a job with uh, Ball Aerospace and did various things out there uh, for 15 years. Finished most of my time making <clears throat> antennas for airplanes and other things. So now the ones with pictures. Now, did you say ask questions as you go along or wait till the end? <laughs> Feel free. Ask, ask right, as we go. You, you, you talked about Top Gun. How realistic was it? Um, Top Gun captured the um, feel of naval aviation very well. The technical details, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the F-35 guys will not buy the idea that they couldn't. You couldn't use um, GPS GPS bombs because of GPS jamming. <clears throat> so this slide has a lot of words on it. And it's, the, the words are there for the folks who really like airplanes and details. We're not going to go through that so much. But I'll say the A6 is pretty much the pickup truck of the Navy. If the Navy had it, except for the Phoenix and the Sparrow, we could pretty much carry it and drop it. So uh, bombs, uh, harpoon missiles, anti-radiation missiles, mines, um, <clears throat> all just very, we could carry it up to about 18,000 pounds. Some particulars on here that you might note. I do have a model over here later if somebody wants to look at it on the side. So one of the prominent features of the airplane is the refueling probe. Uh, when they built the A6, they weren't really concerned about aesthetics, so they just put it up there and left it. <laughs> this part here is the, uh, the tr uh, tram turret. It contains an, um, a laser. It contains a, a, an infrared TV and then also a laser receiver. So that was a big upgrade in the uh, 70s. Um, you see the uh, front gear, on, front nose gear on the airplane has something sticking out, and that's the uh, launch bar, which is what the carrier uses to shoot the airplane off the front. Um, it has full span flaps which give it, and slats, which give it good low speed flight characteristics. And also you'll notice it doesn't have ailerons. So, when you move the stick on the A6, there's a flap on that comes up and kills the lift instead of creating it, which is a little different way of flying. It also has wingtip speed brakes that open like your hands do. Um, the initial ones had speed brakes on the body, but that didn't work as well, so that was a later modification. <clears throat> you might, pardon? Okay, on this picture, you'll note the bombs, like much we saw in the first, uh, first picture. These are 500-pound bombs on the airplane, and it's being pulled off the ship by the launch bar. Um, up here, this is, the airplane is two seats, side by side, one pilot, one bombardier navigator. The BN sits over here, and this is uh, the computer controls for him. He has a stick that talks to the, to the system. There's a radar here, and this is the FLIR. Normally when we fly, that would be covered with a, a fiberglass hood so that it didn't you know, disturb the pilot. But this is a good picture. <clears throat> Armament controls are down the middle. The pilot has the stick, the throttles. It, we did have a TV screen that uh, <clears throat> showed us you know, what was going on flying-wise, what was going on with the bombing system. And we had a, a gun sight, so this predated uh, heads-up displays. Um, the BN could reach over and fly the airplane nominally, but that was more of a fun thing. That was a trick, not something that happened period, you know, normally. <clears throat> My numbers uh, for the A6, I had 2,800 total flight hours. Uh, 22, 24 of them were A6 time. I had 586 traps, of which 241 of those were at night. The day traps I'd be willing to do for free really did need to be paid for the night ones. <laughs> The, like, what's a trap mean? Uh, arrested landing. 
Pardon? Arrested landing, okay. so stopping on the aircraft carrier. Oh, that's dropping on the air truck? <coughs> yeah, okay. so 586 total, wow. 241 at night. Is that an ejection handle? Yes. Well, the, let's see, so the ha there's a handle between here. Uh, this one is for the re is a release for the survival gear on the on the seat. Okay. Um, it does fire some explosive charges and do things, so you don't want to mistakenly pull on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had uh, 40, 40 sorties during Desert Storm. Uh, we'll talk more about that as we go. Let's see. Oh, just so, so the airplane empty weighed about, once we flew, weighed about 28,000 pounds, and we had about 18,000 pounds of thrust, so uh, we weren't going straight up for very long. <laughs> we put some bombs on it, it got a little piggy, but it was about a Mach 0.85, about, it would go about 600 miles an hour in most configurations, so just, and it, it had, we carried 16,000 pounds of gas internal, 2,000 each in the drop tanks, so it was good for two, two and a half hours or so if you, if you needed to do that. Total. Total, yeah. Uh, I was in VA-185. Uh, VA-185 was one of two A6 squadrons on the Midway at the time. Um, we had uh, seven A6Es, which are the bombers. We had two KA6Ds, which are the same. They looked pretty much the same but they don't have a weapon system in them. They have a tow reel in the back, or a, a hose reel in the back that you can use for refueling. We generally had at least one airplane also configured as, with a buddy store, which you can see on this airplane. This is a bomber with a centerline store on it that also has a hose reel in it, so you could use the bombers as tankers also. They held the same amount of gas. It was just a question of whether you had the internal version or the external version you could refuel airplanes. So. Uh, we had about 200 personnel in the squadron. The ship was homeported in Yokohama, Japan. The squadron was based in NAS at Sugi. Both of those are about an hour south of Tokyo by train. They're about an hour apart. Uh, we, we shared at Sugi with uh, the Japanese Navy. Uh, it was very, and we lived on the base for a good part of the time. So it was quite an adventure to be illiterate for two and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> Most interesting story is driving to uh, driving to Yokohama one day, and the Japanese had the signs over the road. We're driving along, and there's, it's in red. You know, something bad's happening somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that was about all we knew. <clears throat> and it was before GPS, so if it was something bad that got you off the route that you knew, God help you. <laughs> uh, Desert Storm stats for the squadron: we flew 457 combat missions. 940 flight hours, and we dropped 720,000 pounds of ordnance. They did not give us permission, but in that is not the gas we transferred with the tankers. Other than that, we'd have been over a million, but so, so be it. <laughs> um, you see the pilots and navigators in green, green flight suits here. Uh, something we'll talk about later is the color of shirts on the aircraft carriers. So we've got our maintenance, our maintenance warrant officers are wearing green shirts. Our uh, ordnance you know, gunner is wearing red, and then we have our two intel officers who are dressed in street clothes practically because <laughs> they worked in the air conditioning. <clears throat> Everybody knows you know, the, uh, the oxymoron naval intelligence, right? <laughs> okay, so we were based on the Midway. The Midway served in the Navy from 1946 to 1992. It was commissioned a week after World War II ended. And uh, the interesting little fact to it on that is my grandfather helped build it. Wow. So in World War II, he worked in the shipyard at the Newport News and worked as an electrician on the Midway for several weeks. So that was an interesting tie back to it. Um, the Midway was commissioned. So I'm diverging here a little bit because I think everybody's interested in ships and airplanes. And so this is sort of an aside. But the Midway was commissioned as a straight deck carrier with an armored deck. It had, you can see, elevators in the middle of the flight deck and one deck edge. Um, they rebuilt it in the 50s to have an angle deck. It, they put a, a, a waist catapult on it and better bow catapults. It still had the forward elevator and it got another deck edge elevator. In the 70s, it was rebuilt again with longer catapults up front, no deck or no deck elevator, and another and better uh, deck edge elevators. At this point, 
the Midway had the largest flight deck in the Navy, and even with the nukes in the, in the uh, fleet, it had more acreage. But it wasn't quite the shape you needed to maximize where airplanes went. So uh, uh, current carriers have four catapults, two on the bow, two on the waist. The Midway only had two, the ones up front. We had three resting wires. Uh, contemporary carriers have four. You only need one, but it's nice to have multiple opportunities. So we, we missed that a little bit. And the air wing that we had, so the air wing being all the airplanes that are assigned to the carrier at the time, we had HS-12, which flew uh, helicopters for search and rescue and anti-submarines. <clears throat> we had VA-115 and 185 flying A-6s. We had VAQ-136 flying EA-6Bs. And VAW-115 flying E-2s, which are the uh, airplanes with the flying saucer on top of them. And then VA-151, 192, and 195 flying F-18s. So we did not have F-14s, there so were never F-14s based on the midway. Uh, which during Desert Storm actually gave us quite a lot of airplanes that could go drop bombs. <clears throat> well, there's a picture of the midway when it was commissioned, lots of guns, straight deck. Uh, this is a picture of it in the configuration it was when I sailed on it. And you can see you can still park quite a few airplanes around. And remember it also had a hangar bay wherever you could work on things and park additional ones. But <clears throat> This narrow, you know, the hangar bay is, is down here, so it didn't get any bigger when they put a bigger deck on it. The other sort of midway, um, thing that made midway unique was it, as they rebuilt it, it drew more and more water. And so when it was in Japan, they decided the thing was just, it, it was drawing like 38 feet of water, the most of any ship in the Navy. So they put blisters on it to raise it up out of the water, which worked really well. It came up several feet. But then it really became unstable. It would rock and roll like no other ship in the Navy. It was crazy. Because you could be coming down to land on it, it would roll to the right, and then it would come back up, and then it would roll to the right again. <laughs> and then it might go left, and then it might roll all the way back to the right. So um, we, the Persian Gulf was a good place to operate the Midway. Not a lot of big waves. The Pacific, with a typhoon down by the Philippines, was not fun. <laughs> So for flight ops on the Midway, um, this is a good picture. So you have two catapults, no waste cats. So to launch airplanes, the front's got to be clear. You can maybe park, you could park airplanes on one side, then you just have one catapult and the launch is really slow. So in order to launch, you taxi up to follow the flight deck director. They hook you up to the shuttle and they have a hold back. You go to full power on a signal. Um, this, you can see the jet blast deflector here is up so that your exhaust doesn't, flow down the, doesn't blow down the flight deck. And then the catapult officer makes sure everything's good, touches the deck, and you, you shoot off. Well, once you're done launching airplanes, it's time to recover them. Well, to do that, this is the angle part. This is the runway, the angle deck on the ship. That's got to be clear. So anything that didn't launch has to be clear of the foul lines. You can have a few airplanes here, a few airplanes here, and then the parking spaces. So as you land airplanes, you would typically land, stop about here, and you taxi down, and you would line them up again all up on the front. So we've launched airplanes, we've recovered airplanes, and now the bow is full of airplanes. We're gonna, we want to launch again in an hour. What do we got to do? Well, uh, this is where the shirts sort of come into the play. You gotta refuel them. Typically you refuel them up forward. That's the purple shirts. So those are the refuelers on the ship. You have to rearm them if, it's, if you're in desert storm. Uh, you gotta get the red shirts up there with the bombs and missiles and whatnot. If you want to repair them or service them, that's the brown shirts, the, uh, the plane captains and maintenance folks. And then you've got to move them. You've got to take them when they're all up here. You may be refueling in different places, but you've got to drag them off the angle, get them, or off the bow, get them out of the way so that you can start the launch sequence again. That's the yellow shirts who run the tractors and flight directors and whatnot. So on a, on a modern nuclear ship, you can pack, they pack mortar planes here on this side so that the, the uh, waste cats are clear and the bow cats are clear. There's more parking spaces that are away from the, the busy parts of the flight deck. Well, the midway, it was especially a ballet. This, 
they could move airplanes like no other ship in the Navy. Um, similarly, you require tractors and ground crew for that. You also require ground crew for starting. The modern ships have power under the deck. In the midway, it was all carts dragged by uh, tractors. So there was stuff, people going everywhere to launch airplanes. And that happens on all ships, but it was more of a valet on the midway. Okay, we're gonna go to Desert Storm. Um, my purpose here is not so much, I'm not gonna talk about how Desert Storm went down. I, I was on the ship, we didn't have CNN, we didn't know much of anything. We knew it was time to eat, it was time to sleep, or it was time to go fly. Um, we got some intelligence briefings, but we really weren't concerned with the con conduct of the war. We were worried about what are we going to do today? How are we going to make this happen? Um, so I'm going to talk about, give you some geographic orientation, and then we'll talk about some particular missions that I went on. And if anybody has questions or comments, please, please say so, because I'm sure there's other folks in the room that were there or know a lot about this. How far off the coast were you staged the ship? <clears throat> so we're, we're down here by Bahrain. And so this is the Persian Gulf, which for the purposes of Desert Storm was renamed the Arabian Gulf. <laughs> Don't know how long that stuck. That stuck. Uh, here's Iraq. Here's Kuwait. Remember, Iraq is bordered on the east by Iran. Uh, we had Syria and Turkey up here. There were forces operating out of Turkey. Um, the Red Sea is over here. We had a couple of aircraft carriers over there. Practically the whole Air Force and Army were in Saudi Arabia. And then we also... Uh, had some, for, had some in, the, in the Mediterranean. As we look a little closer, this is a blow up of uh, Kuwait down here, uh, Iraq up north. There's Kuwait City. Uh, we did a lot of work at, around Umm Qasr, the naval base, the Iraqi naval base. There were various oil rigs and uh, things down here uh, by Bubiyan Island and Falaka Island. And um, we flew up into this part, of, uh, this part of Iraq, and we overflew a fair amount of Kuwait. So the guys from the, uh, from the Red Sea were transiting across this way more into Iraq. We were more uh, oriented toward Kuwait. So Desert Shield was the first uh, part of this odyssey. This is a good picture. Um, it's a KC-135, an Air Force tanker. Um, that's an ace, it's actually a KA-6 refueling off of the uh, boom of the 135. That's a bomber, an A-6 bomber. That's an F-18, and this is an EA-6B, which was a development from the A-6. It has four seats, and it does electronic warfare. <clears throat> so before I launch into this next one, let me get a drip drink. <coughs> Question? Quick one, how long did you serve on the Midway? Uh, about two and a half years. Okay. Two years, yeah, two to two and a half. So <clears throat> who here that, has, that I have not told <laughs> knows the difference between a sea story and a fairy tale? <clears throat> okay. Everybody knows a fairy tale starts once upon a time. A sea story starts, this is no shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> so, uh, Desert Shield began on 7 August of 1990. Uh, I think Iraq was invaded on the 5th. Uh, by the 13th, a week later, even just barely a week later, my squadron had a, had a tasking to provide two A6s to the Midway in the Persian Gulf from Japan. So uh, we, we took three airplanes from Japan to Kyubi Point in the Philippines. Took the best two out of there. Actually took two. The one I took had, fro had <clears throat> uh, air conditioning was full hot. And that was not going to work for a seven hour flight. So we took it back and jumped in another one. <clears throat> Flew south of the Philippines and met a KC-10 and a KC-135 out over the ocean. We followed the, them for a ways and then the KC-10 got, got gas from the 135. The 135 turned around and went back to Guam. And the 286s followed the KC-10 to Diego Garcia. <clears throat> to get to Diego Garcia, you gotta fly through the Straits of Malacca and well south into the Indian Ocean. 
I mean, it, it's, Diogorst is actually in a British Indian Ocean territory, but it's a huge air base. So we showed up there <coughs> uh, with our two A6s and sort of wandering around figuring out how we were going to get them to the independence. We didn't have any communication with the independence. So after wandering around for a while, we figured out we got their air plan. We could see when they were going to be flying. And we had only, but we had to have a tanker to get there. We had no way to task the Air Force. We, we were just wandering around. So we did, you know, we figured out the, the best plan was to go to the O Club. So we went to the O Club and we found the KC-10 guys and then we sent them around to drinks. <laughs> and then we went over and introduced ourselves and they said, yeah, yeah, what do you need to do? We said, well, we need to go to the, pers to go to the Gulf. They said, well, we're going to go flying tomorrow about 8 Do you want to meet us in the ready room about 8 o'clock? So we showed up at 8 o'clock the next day and chartered a KC-10. <laughs> and we launched off from Diego Garcia, we joined up on the KC-10, followed it north. I was the senior officer in the flight, and I did have to exercise my authority one time. I'll just give you the quote. The quote was, Buckethead, don't fly upside down by the tanker. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Lieutenant Green had spent a bit more time at the Oak Club than I did, and he needed to be brought back to reality that morning, but he was fine. And he really had good form. He just needed to be the other side, I'd have his other side up. <laughs> um, so we arrived on the Independence, and uh, I, the squadron CO was a very good friend of mine, Dave Nichols. We landed, we got there, they were recovering airplanes, we called them, got in the pattern, didn't bolter, landed good. And went and saw Dave, and Dave, Dave said, how did you get here? So I told him the story I just told you, and he got about halfway through, and he said, stop, stop, stop. I'm going to have to tell CAG this story. CAG is the air group commander. And so he said, come on, we'll go see him. So we went to see CAG, and we told him the story, and he says, that's incredible. Said, Can you come to dinner with the Admiral tonight? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like the floor show for the Admiral's, for the Admiral's mess that night. And we told the story again. Um, and then they sent us back to uh, sent us back to Japan. Went back to Diego Garcia uh, via the Emirates, and had about a five-hour turnaround there to, to get a KC-10 that was going back to Guam. And then my brother was flying P-3s for the Navy at the time, and so I went. He was actually on Diego Garcia. So two guys from North Carolina met each other on Diego Garcia in the BOQ that night. They said hi, caught up with each other, and uh, said goodbye. So that was uh, that was my best sea story for Gulf for the Gulf War. I uh, went back to Japan, rejoined the squadron. I was the maintenance officer at the time. Uh, the Midway deployed second uh, of October, and it, I think Desert Storm looked like sort of a non-event from the outside. But what was actually going on there it allowed us to get there and take the strike plans, de develop the strike plans and overlay those on like Saudi air bases and actually fly the missions and do the tanking and f do full rehearsals. It also gave the coalition forces time to see each other and talk to each other. So we had practice with the US forces, talking to AWACS, talking to the Air Force, and then also the other countries had chances to integrate into that. We used it, I think, pretty well. We used our time, we made, made good use of it. The Iraqis had time to complete their defensive plans and deployments. Their plans didn't work out as well as ours. <clears throat> For Desert Storm, um, on the next slide, I'll go through some highlights from some of the missions. Um, well, on this slide, actually. So on the 17th of January, Air War started the 16th. That night I did fly, the airplane broke off the catapult. I was with the Air Wing commander, and we ended up dumping our bombs in the water because one thing we had learned from past experience was um, you know, live by your abort criteria. Our abort criteria was no system, don't go over the beach. Um, it was an important, another sort of life lesson there was that you could easily complain about not getting to fly the mission and not getting the medal that goes with it. But it's not, it doesn't make a lot of sense to complain about not getting shot at. There were other opportunities for that. <laughs> so those, those came to fruition later. Um, so I've got six missions here. Uh, there were others, there were some tanker missions, there were other bombing things, but we talk about these. So on the 17th, there was a, the Iraqis had captured a Kuwaiti patrol boat that had a, it was a 57 millimeter radar directed gun on it. 
it was pretty good, pretty good gun. And they were putting it under an oil platform under where we did our ingresses and egresses and bringing it out to shoot at airplanes and then putting it back under the platform. So CAG and I took an airplane with uh, four laser guided bombs and went up to see what was going on. <clears throat> so as the strike went in, we were down lower and he saw the ship, saw this thing, but it was back under the platform before we could get to it. So we made different runs, runs from different angles, setting ourselves up, and we actually put two laser guided bombs into this patrol boat and sank it. <clears throat> but it wasn't quite that straightforward because there was something wrong with the fusing on the airplane, so we actually sank it with bombs that didn't blow up. <laughs> but, you know, there were 1,000-pound laser-guided bombs doing about 600 miles an hour. They made pretty good holes in, there, in the damn thing. Pieces flew off, and, uh, and it did sink. While we're doing it, we're only about, we're less than 10 miles off the coast, and we attracted the attention of some SA-6 guys, so a radar-guided SAMs. And for anybody who's seen this kind of thing, uh, when you see the, the, ball, the bright balls of fire going up into the sky, that's okay because those are going somewhere else. It's the ones that come off the ground and then stop. That are, that's the problem because that means they're incoming. And uh, that, that made it exciting. We dispensed some chaff and we had an EW pod and they worked. That was cool. So. Uh, yeah, that was another, and then on the way out, the strike package had done its thing and they were flying back to the midway. We did our thing, and so we are climbing back up to the strike package, and so what did we look like to our to F-18s? We looked like an airplane that was trying to sneak up on the strike package, so EW gear goes off, big strobes, big bright strobes, and so I turned all the lights on on the airplane, and the strobes went away. So it turns out a very good friend of mine, Tom Heil, almost shot me and the CAG down. That would have been really bad for him. <laughs> and us. <laughs> uh, a few days later, uh, we did a strike with, um, with Mark 20 Rock Eye. We had 12 of them on the airplane against a, another oil platform that had been shooting at airplanes around the Gulf. And, uh, so you've seen pictures of the Mark 82 500 pound bombs. These are rock eye, so they have about 250 bomblets in them. They weigh 500 pounds. They come off the airplane and uh, debt cord in them opens them up, and it scatters these 250 bomblets over about a football field area. So 12 of those, I won't do the math. I don't do public math. It's a lot of hand grenades, <laughs> and it makes a really good show at night. There's lots of sparkly things along the ground. Um, and it's good for people who are out shooting at airplanes if you don't know exactly where they are. Um, and so, you know, we had uh, four airplanes on that, and we, we put a lot of holes in the oil platform one way or another. The unique part of that mission was there were some AAA, some handheld SAMs on the, on the platform, but they weren't a big deal. There was a Mirage, uh, Iraqi Iraq, Mirage fighter airborne at that time. The E-2 told us about it. We got. EW um, indications that we were being painted. We had F-18s with us, they turned and went away. The Mirage, we later found out, went south and the Saudi F-15s took care of that. But that was, that was an exciting part of that mission. Uh, roll ahead to the 28th, I was strike lead on a mission into Umm Qasr. We were generally a triting Iraqi Navy. Um, shortly after this, they, they left. <laughs> We can talk about that in a minute. We put a Mark 83 thousand pound laser guided bomb on a patrol boat sitting at the, at the pier. And um, we also strung a couple of other Mark 83s into town, into the warehouse district. So we were doing that from about 20,000 feet, using the uh, FLIR to find the target, release the bomb, and then the laser goes off the last 10 seconds of flight and guides it to the spot. So uh, we could hit a single patrol boat reliably from up there. Um, and that's high enough that the air, in aircraft artillery, only the really big stuff will get up that high. Um, and the SAMs, those handheld SAMs won't get up that high. The radar guided ones will, or can. So we saw some of those go by. This was a night strike, so you can see all this activity. And it occurred to me then that, there, especially the guys shooting the smaller AAA, must be on a quota system. Because it sure looked like they had to get out there and shoot their quota. You know, there's airplanes coming. Okay, we got a, we owe a thousand rounds. Let's get out and shoot them and get back into undercover. Because they weren't actually shooting it. They weren't threatening us, but they were shooting like hell. 
It would have been bad to fly around down low. Um, 30 January was a, uh, a day strike, a section of A-6s with 12 500 pounders each. And we had some interesting fuses on the airplane, on the bombs. They were uh, variable time fuses, so it's a small radar system that goes in the nose of the bomb and causes it to blow up before, just before it hits the ground. It gives you a good way to scatter fragments out. Uh, even with instantaneous fuses in the bombs, they'll tend to bury themselves about halfway in the ground. And so that limits what the fragments will do. It absorbs a lot of the energy. Um, so that was, you know, so we're carrying Rock Eye, we're carrying Mark 82, 500 pound bombs. <clears throat> we're carrying Mark 83, 500 pound bombs, uh, laser guided versions of each, um, a variety of things but to, meet, to meet the needs of the targets. Even Mark 84, 2,000 pound bombs, we carried those as well. Uh, the ground war started the 24th. It was the famous 100-hour uh, ground war. Uh, we did support that. Uh, the Iraqis uh, lit up or set fire to the Kuwaiti oil wells, uh, which caused smoke to be everywhere. Our flitter would see through that somewhat, but it's still, it's not visual, but it's still attenuated by, by smoke. Uh, we went out and found some vehicles near an oil field. <clears throat> we dropped uh, 12, <clears throat> 12 rock eye on those. We saw in excess of 20 SAM firings that, on that mission. Uh, we saw some radar guided activity, but uh, it was fine. It worked out. And then later on the 28th, we dropped uh, 12 Mark 82s in the Umm Qasr area again. That was as the Iraqis were being pushed back. There were more troop concentrations further north. We did that. We also supported the, there were several retreat routes for the Iraqis and we dropped um, mines on a, on a couple of those on something that's not shown here. So different, I also took pictures of, I don't know if you might remember when the Iraqis started pumping oil into the Gulf. Somebody had to go take pictures of that. I, I got that job. <laughs> so we're flying around through SAM belt, through under SAM coverage, taking pictures of oil being pumped into the Gulf, but it was important that day. Sir, on your first uh, on your first strike there on 17 January, uh, was the intent not to hit the oil platform? That's why you were trying to get the right angle. We just couldn't get. We figured if we hit the oil platform, it would the bomb would blow up on the platform, and that we wouldn't get the bo the boat. The the real the the primary thing was hit the ship. We didn't really care about the oil platform. It was just in the way. Okay. I was going to say because the fact that it wasn't fused right probably was. It was good in a way. It worked out fine. The old yeah, well, we ended, up, yeah, we ended up bombing those things. The Iraqis turned those into sort of uh, AAA outposts, so we ended up dropping bombs on them eventually. But on day two, we were more worried about them shooting at airplanes. Okay, so let's go back. So this sort of why, I'm sort of, a, I was going to talk about what happened after Desert Storm on the next slide, but is, is there anything about airplanes or... Desert Storm, that anybody has a particular question about before I launch into the next part? Sir? How, how many bombs actually worked? Oh, they, it was very rare. It was very rare to get a failure. The, uh, the numbers on the bombs were 98, 99% kind of uh, success. Uh, the laser guided bombs have uh, electric fuses in them. So you get a single point of failure for multiple bombs. If the electric fusing unit is not working quite right, then None of them are going to work. Where the um, these bombs and the Mark 82s have wires that the airplane actually holds on to, depending on how you want it fused. So it's it's more mechanical and not not all. Electric. So you you end up with sort of redundancy in, in that. Where with the electric fusing, there's there's a potential for a single point failure. Sure. Yeah. Ed. Yeah. The uh, A-6, a venerable attack aircraft, 30 years of service, incredible aircraft. As an engineer, what had you scratching your head? What was its glaring flaw or annoying? What annoyed you about it? You thought, what was Grumman thinking when I did this? Um, well, the, the, especially toward the end of my tour, as we got to Desert Storm, the contrast was we were flying an analog airplane, essentially. The, the FLIR was digital, but the airplane was basically analog. And the same with the, F4, the original F-14. They were the height of analog technology. So they just had an, an infinite number of failure modes. The digital airplanes, like the F-18, you plug it in, you ask it if it's working, it says, yes, I'm working. You could pretty well count on it to work. 
Well, day six, you ask if it's working, it might say yes now, and 10 seconds later, it might say hell no. <laughs> so, yeah, the, just the nature of the electronics and the ability to keep it working. And we were running about 50 maintenance man hours per flight hour on the airplane, which is a big reason for why it was retired. So the, the digital electronics may not have been more accurate, but they were, they were reliable and consistent. You're pretty tall. Um, did you fit in that plane well? I was, uh, I have a long torso. I was right at supposedly the max of what was allowed with the ejection seat. And with the A6, you ejected, um, you see how the canopy opens. You can eject the canopy off the airplane, but to just pull the ejection handle, we would go through the canopy. It, it didn't leave. And it, the, the you know, big question was, do you want to pull the lever and eject the canopy and maybe have it not get all the way off or just go ahead and leave. But usually my friends who ejected never really had a chance to think much. It was time to leave and so they left. So that begs the question, did you ever? No, I never jumped out of an airplane. Okay. I did touch, I did grab the handle a couple times, but didn't pull. Uh, go ahead. Did you ever miss the cable on the midway? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Um, well, you, you land on the you land on the ship, and you're trained to go to full to keep the airplane at the correct attitude, so that the hook stays down on the deck. You go to full power, and you roll down the angle deck, and typically you'll take off before you get to the end. Uh, and we actually practice touch and goes sometimes. Um, boarding rate for most people is 95, 97 percent. So it's and all the landings are graded. So the LSOs are back there watching, and they, after you fly a pass, they'll grade it and say what you did right. Or they don't care what you did right. They, they tell you what you did wrong. <laughs> um, and you know, the day, day landings as well as night. And boarding, boarding rate is definitely lower at night because there's just less to look at and less to, to see what's going on. Sir? Is the least reliable avionics system on your A6? <clears throat> The, the, single, the one that was the most aggravating was the computer. Uh, they, it worked, but, well, they, probably the inertial. Let me say the inertial. Because they, sort of, they would work, some of them just worked better than others. They would, they would work, but then they, some airplanes just didn't bomb worth a damn. And you, you, replace the, you replace the inertial in it, and all of a sudden it's bombing good. The computer's still working, the radar's working, the flare's working. The thing that seemed to be the most inconsistent was the inertial. And we didn't really have, we would send them to AIMD, the intermediate maintenance people, and they would tune it up and send it back to us. And it might work better for a while, but you've got gyros and lots of delicate equipment in them, and you bang them, on, you bang them off the catapult and onto the deck a few times, and now who knows what you got. Does that go with your experience on that? Well, I was an aviation electronics technician, and our group was constantly replacing the Doppler radar. We didn't use the Doppler much on the A6. It had one, but uh, we didn't really use it a lot. Uh, I, I flew the A7 when I was in Fallon, and we really relied on the Doppler to keep the inertial sort of under control. But the A6, yeah, the A6 didn't seem to mechanize it quite as much. Yes, in the back. I was just uh, wondering, um, did you ever deploy with or operate with Marine A6 and F-18 units, or was that a, a different mission set? Um, I did not. The, uh, I know a lot of my friends did. I know the Marines deployed on, on a number of carriers. So um, I did workups with them, but then left the squadron before deployment. Uh, 533 deployed with 75 after my first tour. And they, you know, we were acclimated to the ship. They were not. It was, there were some adjustments to operating off the ship. Uh, yeah, sir. How resilient was the A6 in surviving enemy damage? Not particularly. I think there was a lot learned about damage after the A6 was built. The biggest problem with the plane was um, the bottom, the bottom uh, skin of the wing was stressed. So if, it, if you took a significant hit, in the, especially on in the inner wing panels, that was, that was a significant problem. Uh, the Midway went through the entire Desert Storm War without any airplanes being hit by anything. Uh, A6s, there were several A6s lost from other ships for you know, various reasons. 
Oh, sure. What was your recollection of when 50 years after the end of World War II, the Japanese shot down the V-6? I knew the guy who flew that airplane. <laughs> he, was in, he was in 185 with me. And that was just a standard screw up. Uh, the A-6 could tow a target sleeve, which was especially helpful for uh, close-in weapon systems, the Phoenix, little ra radar guns that look like R2-D2. Well, in this Pacific exercise, the Japanese were participating with the Americans and an A-6 uh, off, off of their, I forget which ships that proceeded, came after the Midway, I think it was the Indy, off the Indy. Uh, he's towing a target sleeve, and the idea, he towed it on about a mile and a half of cable and you would overfly the ship, and they would, and you would tell them you're overfly, and they would turn the thing on, and then they would see the target sleeve coming, and they would shoot it. And typically, it was so accurate, it would shoot the target sleeve off of the cable. It would shoot right where the where it was attached. Well, somewhere in translation, there was some problem, and they turned it on early and shot the airplane down. And it worked. The the, you know, the, the Sea Whiz or you know, worked really well. It shot the hell out of it. <laughs> But uh, yeah, Royster, uh, Will Royster, he had a little bit of a tough ejection, and, but that was, that was an interesting time. But since we were retiring A6s, uh, it was sort of a no harm, no, harm, no foul thing, government to government. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I flew the A6, but I don't, you know, I never heard that story about the, until just actually recently oh. that the Japanese had shot down an A6. Yeah, it was the first airplane shot down by the Japanese since World War II. <laughs> 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 neither, neither side really wanted to talk about it. <laughs> and it was out, it was out at sea, and so it was sort of, it was sort of a, did, it, yeah, it happened, but you know, look over there. <laughs> oh. Okay, so I'll be, I'm going to hang around afterwards. I did bring some stuff. Uh, I brought the helmet that actually goes with the flight suit that's up there. I gave this to my son before I knew about the uh, museum, and uh, he declined the opportunity to put it on display. But I did bring it today. Uh, there's a flight jacket up there that I wore. There's, I brought, this one's the typical one I was issued. Um, and then some citations and an A6 model. If anybody cares to look at that stuff, I'll hang around and we can talk about it. Oh, the tail hook is upstairs as well. That, that was good to get that out of my garage. <laughs> so um, I gave this, I gave a similar pitch to this in 2013. It would have been uh, March. Uh, so a little bit of personal stuff. We'll, we'll do a little bit of personal stuff now if that's okay. We've got a few minutes. So uh, in uh, June of 2013, I was diagnosed with uh, stage four throat cancer. So I apologize for my voice today, but it's really much better than it might have been. <laughs> this is a picture of me with a picture with a quilt from uh, my coworkers at Ball Aerospace that they made while I was in uh, chemo treatment. So that it's one of my more prized possessions. I went from uh, about 195 pounds to about 135, 140. Um, they had a 40 chemo, 40 radiation treatments, and seven chemo treatments an operation at Mayo Phoenix. Uh, it was an ordeal. But since then, I've learned that every day counts. So thank you for being a part of this one. This one counts as well. The things that we've done since then in recovery, my wife and I have done a fair amount of dancing. Some of my dancing friends are here. I appreciate that them. I've ridden my bike a lot. Uh, that's a picture taken in South Dakota on the Mickelson Trail, 120 miles or so, a nice vacation. I've done a lot of skiing. Here's a picture with my son and my wife. Uh, and um, I did, what, a million, a million vertical feet two years ago. Last year, only about 850,000. So I've had a good time skiing. I've also done some, uh, given more emphasis to uh, vacation and, and other kind of things. And this was a trip to Alaska where we caught a fish. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's a, about a 40, a 40 or 45 pound king salmon. Just got back from another trip to Alaska and brought some fish back and it worked well. And then here's a picture of me today. and I'm very happy to be here and talk to you guys about uh, what's going on. But uh, you know, certainly the, the cancer journey is one that all of us know somebody who's gone through. 
and it, it's really, um, you come out of it the other end changed, just as going to Desert Storm, you come out of being shot at a bit changed, I think. So those are, these are things we take aboard in our lives and we figure out what they mean. And this one, it just means I'm grateful, grateful to be here today. I, I appreciate your support and your, your attention. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thanks. Give you one of our challenge coins. Oh, from the thank you so much. And again, thank you so much. My pleasure. And again, please visit you know, with Glenn and look at his exhibit upstairs in our War and Terror room. And we also have a short video of him talking about his flight suit and everything. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. So, so, Glenn, one of my big bugaboos about your mannequin up there in the, uh, on display is the helmet. I, I've heard that the before. This doesn't go with the, with the flight gear. Yeah, it's a helicopter helmet. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do better. Well, I've been trying, I've been trying to find one that would, that would fit better. Yep. And uh, I haven't yet, so. Are you sure your son wouldn't want to give that up? I'll ask him again. <laughs> Mm. But he just he just climbed with the Grand Teton yesterday. Maybe he's yeah. feeling gracious. Yeah. <laughs>